This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, with that, we'll get going. And again, welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. It's our pleasure today to, to have uh, Dr. Sherpal Bangalore with us. Uh, he's, an, as you can see from the title there, is Associate Professor at NYU, uh, but it, uh, many of you know him from his work in comparative effectiveness research. He has been involved in a wide variety of areas, hypertension, et cetera. Uh, many of you probably know him most from the ischemia trial and his work in that, in the ischemia chronic kidney CKD portion of that trial. He has really amassed quite an impressive uh, CV for uh, such an early stage career person and has made some very important contributions in this area. Uh, he is an interventional cardiologist by training, trained at the Brigham doing that work, um, but uh, has a much broader uh, scope. And today I think he's going to talk to us about stable ischemic heart disease in patients with CKD. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so we, we're going to discuss about management of uh, stable ischemic heart disease, particularly focusing on patients with CKD, but we can also uh, discuss about patients without CKD as it applies to the uh, ischemia trial. So these are some of my disclosures. I'm the PI for the ischemia CKD trial. I have grant support from NHLBI. And I'm the clinical coordinating center revascularization lead and the regional uh, faculty lead for the ischemia trial. So maybe I thought I'll start off with this patient. Uh, uh, this is a 60-year-old uh, gentleman with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, uh, diabetes, and chronic kidney disease, creatinine of 3, EGFR around 23. And his only complaints have been three months history of exertional dyspnea, and, but no chest pain. I know this uh, cartoon shows maybe he's having chest pain, but uh, this is a patient with uh, exertional dyspnea, no chest pain. So the question is, what should we do for this patient? So he has multiple risk factors and uh, chronic kidney disease, and he has uh, dyspnea on exertion. Should we do um, ischemia evaluation, uh, send him for a stress test, or uh, should we define his anatomy, do a catheter CCTA? And of course, uh, the caveat there is, if you do a CCTA, you're going to use a lot of contrast, and probably the risk of... Uh, Contrast associated acute kidney injury is uh, high for this particular patient. Or should we say that his uh, pretest probability is pretty high given that he has multiple risk factors and also he has chronic kidney disease? Should we just assume that he has coronary artery disease and medically treat him for this? Or um, this is what happens uh, for more majority of uh, chronic kidney disease patients. Should we attribute the symptoms to CKD? In other words, should we uh, assume that uh, this is more of a volume issue and uh, do no further cardiac workup? So in other words, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to this particular uh, patient towards the end of it, but these are uh, some of the options uh, for, for this particular patient. But then, but before that, I want to start off with this. This is a pretty, pretty uh, familiar scene in the streets of um, uh, in U.S. and particularly also in many parts of the world. And this is um, Lancet 2002, uh, with more than 60% of adults and 13% of children classified as overweight or obese, the U.S. has become the fattest nation on earth. This was uh, June 8, 2002, but since then things have changed, and last year we saw in the headlines that Mexico beat us. Mexico is now the fattest nation on the earth, and of course, I mean, we are number two. I think uh, the number two position is nothing to be proud of. Um, and if you, we've all seen these obesity maps. Um, the prevalence of obesity has uh, exponentially increased, and we see that uh, this blue is for prevalence of 15 to 19 percent, and over a period of time we had to add another color, now it's 20 to 24 percent. Then we had to add uh, yet another color for prevalence of 25 to 29 percent, and finally uh, to prevalence of greater than or equal to 30 percent. The reason I show th those slides are, uh, if you look at uh, the obesity maps on the top <laughs> panel and the diabetes maps on the bottom panel, these maps line up against each other. So in other words, there is an uh, exponential increase in obesity, there is exponential increase in uh, diabetes. The other map uh, which overlays both of these maps are this map, how far are you from a McDonald's? And you see that uh, 
these map overlay both the obesity and diabetes map. The reason I'm showing all of these is there is increased prevalence of obesity, increased prevalence of diabetes, and consequently we see that there is an exponential increase in uh, patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. I know some of you might feel that, oh, I don't see patients with chronic kidney disease in my practice, but uh, I'm sure uh, we are going to see uh, these patients in the coming few years. We know that uh, there are 26 million patients with CKD in the U.S. and close to 500 million patients worldwide. And by 2030, with the exponential increase in diabetes and also because of increase in obesity, it's projected that there is going to be a several fold increase in uh, both CKD and end stage renal disease. And we also know that end stage renal disease and CKD are associated with high risk of death from coronary artery disease. And the last point is very important because when we as cardiologists see patients who have chronic kidney disease, you know, we sometimes or many a times we throw our cardiologist hat out and then start staring at the creatinine. We worry about the patient's kidneys, but we, there is data to suggest that CKD patients are five to ten times more likely to die most of the times from cardiovascular disease than to live long enough uh, that they require dialysis for end-stage renal disease. So we'll come back to this point, which is, I think, uh, critical uh, for cardiologists treating patients with chronic kidney disease. Of course, I mean, we have known that the risk of uh, uh, mortality and also cardiovascular events uh, uh, as an exponential relationship with uh, decreasing GFR. This is data from the Kaiser Registry of 1.1 uh, million stable outpatients not on dialysis. And as we see here, with lower GFR, there is exponential increase in mortality and exponential increase in cardiovascular events. So if you were to uh, use this and project four-year uh, rates, the four-year death rates are around 50%. So in other words, half of these patients won't, won't be alive in uh, four years. And the majority of these patients are going to have cardiovascular events. So in other words, I mean, this is one of the reasons, uh, you know, cardiologists are extremely important because we are going to see these patients either as uh, uh, because we're trying to do a primary, primary prevention strategy or because they have an event and come into the hospital for cardiovascular events. And of course, if you throw in SPECT for these patients, so if uh, chronic kidney disease patients undergo SPECT and have an abnormal SPECT, this is data showing that with the decreasing renal function, uh, with an abnormal SPECT, the risk of cardiovascular events and, and all-cause mortality is exponential. Uh, using this data, if you have severe renal ins insufficiency in an abnormal spec, that the mortality at four years is 88%. So a significant um, exponential increase in death if you have both CKD and coronary artery disease. This has also been shown for various other stress modalities. This is uh, data looking at stress echoes. And again, we see the same relationship with patients with uh, advanced chronic kidney disease. The mortality of four years is in excess of uh, 50%. So this slide kind of summarizes all of the kind of the four-year projections of event rates in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease, and we see that um, the mortality is, is greater than 50%, and the cardiac death and MI rates are greater than 55%, and if you look at a composite cardiovascular outcomes, uh, their, their event rates are pr very high. And in fact, this, their prognosis is worse than certain cancer. I mean, there is a lot of... Um, um, advances uh, in uh, increasing awareness about breast cancer, but uh, these are dismal uh, uh, prognosis for patients with chronic kidney disease. But interestingly, I mean, not many people are well aware of uh, uh, all these uh, cardiovascular events in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. But we also have noticed a treatment risk paradox. I mean, these are the patients with highest risk of cardiovascular events, but CKD patients tend to be undertreated with medical therapy, and in fact, they have lower rates of both referral for stress testing, um, they have lower rates of cath and revascularization than low-risk patients. In other words, we tend to do everything for a 40-year-old who pre present with atypical chest pain. I mean, we, might, we might draw troponins on him and uh, do a stress test, send him for a CT, and in, eventually for a cath. But patients with CKD where the prevalence of coronary artery disease is very high, they tend to be um, under-treated and under-tested. And this is data from the uh, Duke database uh, looking at 4,500 patients with clinically significant CAD. And if you look at the rates of PCI and cabbage on these patients, you see that with uh, worsening um, uh, renal function, 
the, there is decrease in referral rates to PCI and cabbage, and patients with severe uh, renal dysfunction or end-stage renal disease, less than half of those patients undergo revascularization. It's not just uh, revascularization. We also know that these patients are undertreated with medical therapy, and this is data from the event registry. 4,700 patients who are undergoing PCI, uh, most of it was for acute coronary syndromes, and you see even a usage of medicines such as aspirin, uh, clopidogrel, ACE, and statins uh, seem to be underused in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease, and especially if uh, you have advanced CKD with GFR less than uh, 30. And of course, there might be other reasons, and of course, people uh, who are not using some of these medications might say that, oh, look, I mean, there isn't much data to support the use of these uh, agents in patients with chronic kidney disease, um, or I'm worried more about the risk of bleeding uh, in patients with CKD. So we do have a lot of challenges in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, one of the main thing is, I mean, we're all trained to assess um, for coronary artery disease in our, our patients who are referred uh, to us. And one of the main things we use is, uh, um, uh, is to take a good history and we drill it to all of our fellows that we need to take a good chest pain uh, history. But uh, interestingly, in patients with CKDs, chest pain is a poor predictor of CAD in CKD patients. And the reason for this is many of the patients tend to be asymptomatic, and there is data to suggest that this is mainly because of autonomic dysfunction, either from uremia or from diabetes. So uh, diabetes tends, tends to be extremely prevalent in this group of patients, and they do have autonomic dysfunction, and they uh, usually do not present with uh, chest pain. So the other thing that we uh, drill into our fellows are that if you're asking for chest pain history, please ask about exertional uh, chest pain. I mean, all of the characteristics of uh, typical angina. But interestingly, that becomes problematic in CKD patients because most of them uh, lead a sedentary lifestyle. They have a lot of comorbidities, but interestingly, there is data to suggest that CKD patients also have muscle weakness um, and also anemia, all of which, uh, you know, because of which they are less likely to exert uh, themselves. So if you are trying to do an ass assessment of CAD on clinical grounds based on a uh, history of uh, chest pain or history of uh, exertional chest pain, it's going to be uh, difficult. So in fact, there, is a, there are a number of data to suggest that chest pain has poor sensitivity and specificity for predicting CAD in CKD patients. As we see here, it's 65% and 66% uh, respectively. And uh, this is one of the main reasons that these patients tend not to be even referred for stress testing because the clinical suspicion is low because these patients don't present with chest pain. The other challenge we have is uh, even if we go past the first hurdle of uh, trying to figure out if this patient clinically has coronary artery disease um, and we refer them for stress testing, there, is uh, there are data to suggest that the sensitivity and specificity of stress testing in the CKD cohort, when you compare it to uh, patients without CKD, is somewhat poor. This is a, a Cochrane meta-analysis looking at the butamine uh, stress echo and MPI. And of course, uh, I know that this, this hospital is pretty uh, strong with MPIs. But the, the story for uh, any of the stress modality is if you compare it to non-CKD patients, patients with CKD, there is, uh, the stress modalities tends to be less sensitive and also less specific when compared to patients without CKD. And there are a number of reasons for reduced accuracy of stress testing in this uh, group of patients. Most of these patients have uh, hypertension and LV hypertrophy, and we know that from these patients that there is a reduced coronary flow reserve in these patients. Um, there is also con uh, uh, concern for balanced ischemia. Most of these patients, the prevalence of CAD is very high, especially with multivessel coronary artery disease. There is also concern about uh, reduced coronary vasodilatation uh, if you use adenosine or other vasodilators uh, due to calcification of both the macro and microvasculature, especially in patients who are on dialysis. And also because of LVH and other uh, factors, there is just a greater inter-observer availability in uh, reading stress tests in CKD patients. So in, just to summarize, if you look at cardiovascular disease in CKD patients, we know that it has an earlier onset, there is more rapid progression, but interestingly, there is strong association with calcification, uh, especially in patients who are already on dialysis. Um, because of which, there is increased vascular stiffness, there is also resistance to lip lipid lowering properties of statins. And of course, I mean, we all know the benefits of using statins in non CKD patients, but in CKD patients, uh, the benefit is not shown to be as robust. 
Um, there is also increased complication with revascularization uh, with the high rates of uh, sudden death. So uh, if you look at uh, renal guidelines, the KDOQI guidelines, they emphasize that detection and management of CVD uh, should be a standard component of care for all patients with CKD. So the renal guidelines would consider patients with CKD at the highest risk for cardiovascular disease. And they recognize and recommend that all patients with CKD should undergo routine assessment of a cardiovascular disease because regular screening may help identify CKD patients who would benefit from intervention to reduce CVD risk. And stress testing could be one uh, option to appropriately risk stratify and uh, prognosticate and guide further management for these patients. The other big challenge we have for these group of patients, we know the risk of cardiovascular uh, disease is very high, but they tend to be underrepresented in clinical trials. And we have seen this. Um, if you look at cardiovascular clinical trials, the majority of cardiovascular clinical trials here, 80% of CAD trials exclude patients with CKD and ESRD. And this applies to all group of patients, patients with acute coronary syndromes, patients with stable ischemic heart disease, and so what we are left with is when we see a patient with an MI with advanced CKD, we tend to extrapolate the results from done uh, using trials in non-CKD patients and assume that they, they might potentially work in patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. So going back to our patient, this is a, a gentleman, multiple risk factors in CKD, was having exertional dyspnea, no chest pain. He had a, 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 a nuclear spect, pharmacological spect, and of course we see a significant reversible uh, defect in his uh, anterior wall. So the question for, uh, for the management of this patient is what should we do for this patient next? Should we uh, do a cath and revascularization? Um, he has chronic kidney disease, not on dialysis, his GFR is 23, but his uh, CKD has been pretty stable. Uh, should we subject him to for cath and revasc, or should we do medical therapy, avoid cath at any cost, because there is exponential increase in um, the uh, risk of uh, contrast-associated uh, acute kidney injury? Or should we say that this is a false positive stress test, because this patient does not have chest pain, uh, he just only has uh, dyspnea on exertion? Well, again, we'll come back to this uh, patient, but the other patients we uh, see, uh, many of our cardiologists see, are patients uh, such as this. So this is a 50-year-old, 58-year-old uh, male with multiple risk factors, CKD, GFR of 19, and this patient is completely asymptomatic. And uh, this patient had a stress echo ordered as part of pre-renal transplant evaluation. So we, we try and tend to see many of these patients where they're asymptomatic, but their stress test is done part of a pre-renal transplant evaluation. I also have to note that this patient has no uh, living kidney donor and blood group is o, uh, o positive. And this is important because uh, if you look at the wait time in the US, uh, the wait time for a patient such as this who has no living donor and uh, O positive is around five to seven years. So we're doing a stress test today for a kidney transplant that's gonna occur in uh, five to seven years. Um, in terms of his stress echo, it was positive. He exercised for around seven minutes and he had one millimeter ST depression in lateral leads. And echo images showed a new hypokinesis in uh, mainly the RCA territory with no LV dilatation. So, um, so uh, what are the reasons to revascularize uh, patients in stable ischemic heart disease? So if you have uh, patients with or without CKD, one of the commonly cited reasons is to improve survival. And if you have a patient with CKD uh, where the only reason to do a stress test is to, um, for renal transplant evaluation, the most common reason I hear from people are to improve survival during the wait time for renal transplant. So you're waiting for five to seven years, and we know that many of these patients die um, uh, in, those, uh, in that uh, wait time. So one of the notion is uh, maybe we're improving survival during the wait time by revascularizing those patients. The other common um, uh, uh, things that I hear is in patients who are undergoing renal transplant, if you revascularize them, there is likely reduced periprocedural cardiac events around the time of renal transplant. And uh, the other reason uh, to revascularize in patients with or without CKD is to improve quality of life, and especially if they have symptoms. So let's look at some of the evidence-based, look at impact of revascularization and prognosis in stable ischemic heart disease. Um, this is uh, mainly for patients without CKD, but in terms of randomized clinical strategy trials, I mean, this slide kind of includes all of the randomized trials. We can categorize them into three distinct buckets. 
Uh, back in the 70s and 80s, we had cabbage versus medical therapy, but there was hardly any medical therapy back in the day. So these are in essence cabbage versus no cabbage trials. In 90s and 2000s, we had PCI mainly with bare metal stents, uh, comparing with uh, some medical therapy. And in the late 2000s, we had PCI again with the bare metal stents and some usage of first generation drug eluding stents, but this time comparing against optimal medical therapy. So there are these three buckets of trials and let's see if uh, these trials can help uh, manage patients with uh, um, stable ischemic heart disease. So if you look at CABG versus no CABG trials, the major trials are uh, three of these trials, the V8 uh, study, the European study, and the CAS study. They enrolled uh, just over 600 patients. And in each of these trials, you can see that patients who were randomized to CABG had a better uh, survival when compared to patients um, with uh, no cabbage. And if you pull all of these studies, you see that at five years, there is a mortality benefit of bypass compared to no bypass. But at 10 years, you see that the curve starts converging and th there is still a significant benefit, but the p-value becomes uh, modest. So at least back in the day, if you look at 10-year outcomes, there is a suggestion of mortality benefit of bypass against no bypass. And again, there was hardly any medical therapy uh, in this uh, um, era. So next, moving to the pre-optimum medical therapy era, there were a number of trials, and I've summarized uh, some of these trials here, 11 randomized trials, close to 3,000 patients, comparing PCI versus medical therapy. And as we see on this slide, there was no difference in death, cardiac death or MI non-fatal MI, or even for repeat revascularization with PCI when compared to medical therapy. And finally, moving into the OMT era, there were three major trials, Courage, Barry 2D, and FAME2. I'm only going to show uh, a summary slide for each of these. In the Courage trial, uh, 2,200 patients with SIHD were randomized to PCI plus OMT or OMT alone. Primary endpoint of death or MI, and we all know the results, PCI did not reduce death or MI in SIHD patients. This was a trial uh, where uh, only bare metal stents were used. And of note, in patients who were randomized to OMT, a third of them crossed over and received uh, PCI. So Barry 2D enrolled a higher risk group of patients, uh, 2368 patients with type 2 diabetes and SIHD. And they were randomized either to prompt revascularization, either PCI or bypass, plus optimal medical therapy or OMT alone. And the primary endpoint was all-cause death and Barry 2 d again, prompt revascularization did not improve survival in diabetic patients with SIHD. In Barry 2 d um, it was mainly bare metal stents with a, uh, with a third of these patients receiving uh, first-generation drug-eluting stents. And um, in Barry 2 d uh, in patients who were randomized to medical therapy, 42% of them crossed over by year five and underwent uh, revascularization. And finally, if you look at the most uh, contemporary trial, the FAME2 trial, again, FAME2 was terminated early because of significant benefit driven by urgent revascularization. But if you look at death and uh, uh, myocardial infarction, there was actually no difference with the strategy of PCI, uh, FFR guided PCI versus medical therapy. So, no difference in death or MI in patients, um, even in the FAME2 trial. So, and this uh, analysis uh, we published a few years ago, looking at 12 randomized trials, just over 7,000 patients comparing PCI with medical therapy. And again, we find that there is no uh, difference in all-cause mortality, cardiac death, non-fatal MI, repeat revascularization. In our analysis, there was a 17% decrease in angina favoring PCI when compared to uh, medical therapy, um, but no difference in death or MI. So the question has always been, why have... Uh, um, trials in, in the stable ischemic heart disease arena not shown a benefit at reducing MI uh, by revascularization. And I think some of the answer is kind of on this slide. So we know that from the studies done in the 80s and 90s, looking at coronary artery stenosis uh, severity prior to MI, we know that only 14% of the MIs were caused by coronary stenosis, which are greater than 70%. I mean, this is our target for PCI. And in this study, the majority of uh, uh, coronary stenosis that were more likely to rupture and cause an MI were uh, lesions which are under 70%. So I think the one thing that, uh, for me, the take home from, uh, from studies such as this is the importance of optimal medical therapy. So uh, it's, it's critical to use optimal medical therapy so that we can um, target lesions which are not 
usually targeted for PCI. So whatever data I showed from randomized trials are patients uh, without uh, CKD for the majority of parts. So what is the evidence to support either revascularization medical therapy in patients uh, with chronic kidney disease? So I showed a slide where it said most of the patients, uh, most of the cardiovascular trials have routinely excluded CKD patients. And this is also true for uh, uh, revascularization versus medical therapy trials. Barry2D subjects with creatinine greater than 2 milligram, uh, milligrams were excluded. In Courage, uh, only 16 patients had EGFR less than 30. So it's very difficult to make any uh, conclusion on the benefits of revascularization versus medical therapy in patients with uh, CKD. <coughs> So we are left with uh, looking at observational studies. And of course, observational studies have a lot of uh, um, uh, issues. Uh, we did pool all of these observational studies. Uh, this was uh, presented a couple of years ago at AHA. And what we showed was, if you purely look at observational studies in CKD patients, there is a potential mortality benefit of PCI compared to medical therapy, potential benefit of cabbage versus medical therapy. And of course, there is a lot of issues with this. There is a lot of selection bias. There's a lot of ascertainment bias. And there, is, uh, there was no data on the quality of medical therapy uh, in these patients. And uh, ACCHA guidelines for PCI do recognize this. They say state that RCTs of coronary vascularization versus medical therapy in patients with CKD have not been reported. And they go on to say that some observational studies have demonstrated an improved uh, some survival with revascularization co compared to medical therapy, despite the fact that the incidence of periprocedural complication is increased in CKD compared to those without CKD. So in other words, although the upfront risk is high, uh, at least the observational studies uh, seems to suggest that there might be a late benefit. So uh, we saw the slide before, why do we revascularize patients in, with uh, stable ischemic heart disease? So we see that from at least randomized trials, there is no data to support that we are actually improving survival with revascularization. And uh, this is also true for uh, patients uh, who, who, where revascularization is performed as part of uh, pre-renal transplant evaluation. There is no data from randomized trials to suggest that you're improving survival in those patients. What about the fact that if you revascularize patients who are especially for renal transplant eval, you can reduce periprocedural cardiac events. So let's look at randomized uh, uh, trial data to support or refute this uh, notion. So impact of prophylactic revascularization prior to non-cardiac surgery. So if you look at randomized trials, there are no randomized trials specifically targeting patients with renal transplant. So we're left with looking at uh, patients uh, where revascularization was performed before major, elect, uh, major vascular surgery. So this is the CARP trial. I'm sure most of you are uh, aware of this. 510 patients undergoing vascular surgery. They were randomized to rev revascularization or no revascularization. In fact, the majority of them underwent bypass surgery compared to medical therapy alone. And in this, um, at the end of six years, you see that there was no difference uh, between coronary artery revascularization versus no coronary artery revascularization in, uh, before major vascular surgery. And of course, I mean, if you look at the um, early time points, you see that the numerically, at least, there are more events in patients randomized to coronary revascularization compared to no coronary revascularization. If you look at post-operative MI, again, there was no difference uh, in uh, early or late events. Um, comparing revascularization versus no revascularization. We have one other trial, the Decrease 5 pilot uh, study. And the Decrease 5 included a higher risk group of patients, 101 patients with extensive stress-induced ischemia. I mean, these are not patients with mild ischemia. They had extensive st uh, stress-induced uh, ischemia. In fact, nearly half of them also had angina, and the patients were randomized before major vascular surgery to revascularization versus medical therapy. And these are the results. For the first 30 days, we again see that numerically, revascularization, there was more events compared to medical therapy, statistically no different. And if you look at uh, extended follow-up up to 12 months, again, no difference, numerically more events with the revascularization compared to a medical therapy. So they concluded by stating that preoperative coronary revascularization in high-risk patients was not associated with um, uh, improved outcomes in the Decrease 5 uh, pilot uh, study. So uh, we see that the, uh, some of the commonly stated reasons to revascularize patients with stable ischemic heart disease, 
to improve survival and to reduce periprocedural cardiac events around the time of renal transplant is not completely supported by randomized trial data. I won't show much on improvement of quality of life, uh, but we have seen from Courage and Barry 2D, but at least with PCI, there is a better and faster relief of angina, but uh, over a period of time, uh, medical therapy catches on. And in the COURAGE trial, at three years, there was no difference in angina relief between PCI and medical therapy. But in Barry 2D, we saw that with bypass surgery, there is the difference uh, persists up till five years, but the absolute uh, difference between PC, um, with the bypass and medical therapy decreases over a period of time. Um, in patients with chronic kidney disease, most of them don't present with chest pain. I mean, it's usually anginal equivalent, so it becomes a bit more challenging to assess improvement in quality of life. So what do uh, guidelines recommend for management of patients with stable ischemic heart disease with or without CKD? So there are two reasons uh, to revascularize patients with stable ischemic heart disease uh, to improve survival. I know this is a busy slide, but all I want to show is the green ones, which are the class 1 indication. And the class 1 indication is only for a few uh, indications. This is for bypass surgery in patients with three vessel disease with or without proximal LAD disease. It's also class one for uh, patients with for bypass surgery for two vessel disease with proximal LAD uh, disease. And uh, it's a class one for either cabbage or PCI for survivors of sudden cardiac death with presumed ischemic mediated VT. So these are the only class one indications in SIHD patients to improve survival. I mean, this is not much to do with uh, CKD, but uh, uh, it's, it's for either group of patients that if you have a high-risk anatomy or uh, patients who, had, uh, who are survivors of sudden cardiac death, these are class 1 indication to improve survival on those patients. What are the indications to improve symptoms? And this is again from ACCHA PCI guidelines. Uh, that it's reasonable to revascularize if a patient has one or more significant stenosis, which is amenable to revasc, but also has unacceptable angina despite guideline-directed medical therapy. In other words, there is more emphasis on the fact that the patient should be on medical therapy before uh, they're taken, to the, uh, taken for uh, revascularization. And if, uh, if you switch to patients undergoing renal transplant evaluation, th this is the ACCHA scientific statement. And they say that there is no evidence to support prophylactic preoperative uh, percutaneous revascularization in patients with asymptomatic uh, ischemia or stable angina. And in fact, they go on to say that it is not recommended that routine prophylactic coronary revascularization be performed in patients with stable CAD uh, who, who have um, absent, absent symptoms or survival indications. So in other words, if your indication is not triple vessel disease or left main disease, um, uh, so the, uh, before transplant surgery, it's, uh, they actually say that it's a class three level of evidence B uh, recommendations to do a routine revascularization for these patients. But interestingly, the um, practice in the U.S. and around the world is to routinely revascularize these patients uh, despite lack of evidence and despite uh, guideline recommendations. Um, for, for patients, when we are thinking about revascularization, uh, we also worry about the risk of uh, uh, complications and acute kidney injury with uh, revascularization. And we all know this, the risk of contrast-induced acute kidney injury, there is an exponential increase with decreasing uh, GFR. And uh, this has been shown in uh, multiple studies, and this risk is uh, higher in patients with diabetes when compared to patients uh, without diabetes, and especially with GFR uh, of uh, less than 40. Um, but there is always this competing uh, risk of uh, death versus ESRD. So this is a uh, study uh, published by David Charton from the Brigham looking at the competing uh, risk of death versus ESRD in patients with uh, CKD who are undergoing revascularization. Interestingly, what they found was in patients who are undergoing revascularization who had CKD, the three-year cumulative incidence of ESRD was lower than that of death. So in other words, these are patients who started uh, not being on dialysis. The risk of dialysis was 6.8% with bypass, 5.4% with PCI, but the risk of death at three years was 28% with uh, bypass surgery and 33% uh, with that of PCI. So in other words, the risk of um, death was much greater than the risk of yeah, ESRD. So most of us if we have a patient with chronic kidney disease, we look at their creatinine and start worrying about their creatinine, 
uh, whereas uh, the uh, actual mortality is uh, usually from cardiovascular disease. So they concluded by stating that among uh, CKD patients undergoing uh, coronary vascularization, death is more frequent than uh, end-stage renal disease uh, requiring uh, dialysis. There are other problems uh, with the revascularization and chronic kidney disease. We know that there is a significant increase in short-term risk. Uh, there is increased risk of bleeding from the use of antiplatelet and anticoagulant uh, uh, medications. There is increase in periprocedural MI in patients with CKD. We also looked at, um, we showed some data on contrast-induced AKIs and need for dialysis on, in these uh, patients. And also increased risk of death, whether it's with PCI or bypass surgery. There is also increased risk of uh, long-term risk, and I think this is uh, mainly applicable for strategies where routine revascularization is uh, used uh, in patients who are waiting for renal transplant. In the five to seven years they wait for renal transplants, if you were to revascularize them with PCI today, they have an extremely increased risk of uh, restenosis. This has been shown in multiple studies that CKD patients have higher risk of restenosis. They also have a higher risk of uh, stent thrombosis. All uh, something to also uh, bear in mind. So we'll discuss uh, the ischemia CKD trial, how it fits into the management of stable ischemic heart disease. So this is a large NHLBI-funded trial. So we're enrolling patients with uh, ischemia on stress testing, who have a GFR less than 30 or on dialysis. And these patients, uh, uh, this is up front of the cath lab. They'll be randomized soon after a positive stress test and they'll be randomized either through an invasive strategy, which starts with cath first and optimal revascularization, either PCI or bypass, along with optimal medical therapy, or to a conservative strategy of uh, OMT alone, with cath reserved for uh, uh, OMT failures. And this, this um, CKD trial is being done in, uh, in parallel to that of the main ischemia trial, which is enrolling patients with GFR greater than 30. Again, I mean, the genesis for this trial is um, we had designed the ischemia trial, and just like every other cardiovascular trial, we were excluding patients with advanced CKD, and there was uh, interest from DSMB and many of us that why are we excluding this group of patients? This is a good group of patients. We need to study. We need to know this answer, and uh, that's kind of is the genesis. So the trial was funded a couple of years ago. We've been up and running uh, for uh, in terms of uh, randomizing for a year and a half now. And the unique design of this trial um, reduces contrast exposure. So we're randomizing up front of the cath lab, so there is the contrast exposure uh, risk in the CKD trial is minimized. In patients who are randomized to conservative strategy, the OMT arm, there is no contrast exposure. Uh, so this is half of the patients. Of course, there is some contrast exposure in patients uh, who have diagnostic cath go on for uh, bypass and more contrast exposure in uh, patients um, uh, who undergo diagnostic cath and PCI. Um, the good part of the, about the trial is there is an emphasis on optimal medical therapy. I mean, uh, these are patients who are, uh, you know, so we had a lot of issues trying to figure out what is optimal medical therapy because if you look at the cardiovascular literature, many of the trials exclude these patients. So it was a bit of a challenge, uh, but we do have uh, risk factor goals. We have uh, behavioral risk factor goals. We have BP goals. Some of the BP goals may potentially change with the SPRINT trial. Uh, we are still uh, debating and discussing this. We have HbA1c goal. We have uh, pharmacotherapy for these uh, patients. Uh, but going back to our first patient, this was a 60-year-old patient, multiple risk factors with uh, creatinine of 3, and his only symptom was dyspnea on exertion and no chest pain. We saw that we sent him for a stress test, and his stress test was showed uh, reversible ischemia in the anterior wall in the LAD territory. And this patient was actually enrolled in the ischemia CKD trial, and he was randomized to the invasive strategy. Um, so his coronary angiogram showed a severe uh, LAD stenosis. And in fact, I mean, this is a patient whose creatinine was around three. Um, so we recommend a aggressive hydration protocol. So in fact, for um, most of our sites, we give them a customized hydration protocol based on patient's uh, creatinine and weight. And this is based on the Poseidon trial. So in this particular patient, uh, this was the protocol. We asked him to drink at least, I mean, his GFR, I mean, his EF is normal. So you, we had recommended him to drink four to six cups of water on the morning of the cath. We started um, normal saline at around 20, uh, 210 ml, uh, one hour before angiography. 
We measured his LVDP as soon as we uh, had him in the cath lab, his EDP was 16. We continued his hydration uh, protocol based on his LVDP at around uh, 210 ml per hour and for uh, at least four hours post. Uh, we strongly recommend ultra low volume contrast protocol for cath and PCI. It's amazing that uh, you can do these procedures using minimal amount of contrast. So in this case, uh, two shots of the left coronary artery, uh, 10 ml of contrast, um, one shot of the right. Uh, we did IVUS guided PCI. So in other words, once you have a diagnostic films, uh, you wire the lesion and most of the rest of the procedure can be done using IVUS guidance. Um, we do uh, uh, stent sizing, stent uh, length using IVUS. Um, uh, and post dilatation using IVUS. You do a post procedure IVUS. Of course, you also do a final angiogram just to document. In this particular patient, the total, total contrast used was around 30 ml. And this is what happened to his serum creatinine. Uh, uh, this was at baseline three. And, and this is what we routinely see. Either the creatinine slightly goes down or remains uh, stable. One of the um, most important things we have seen for these patients are uh, you know, everybody says they're hydrating these patients, but their hydrations, uh, you know, you only, and uh, they end up giving only 500 cc's. So what we have seen is measuring LVDP is a very good um, indicator of the volume status. Um, many a times, I mean, we are under hydrating most of these patients. So there is a lot of emphasis on aggressive hydration protocol and ultra low volume contrast protocol for these patients. And in the trial, this has been extremely helpful uh, for our sites. I want to just give an update on the uh, ischemia trial first. Uh, they are, we are enrolling patients with uh, GFR 30 or higher, and this is where we stand in terms of the ischemia trial. We have enrolled 4,000 patients and randomized uh, 2384 patients. So in terms of, uh, if you compare Courage and Barry 2D, we have surpassed Courage and Barry 2D. So technically, we're the largest uh, strategy trial uh, in patients with SIHD. There are a number of patients who've been excluded for various reasons. Um, interestingly, left main is around 9% of patients, and this has been consistent over the last few years that uh, uh, among patients with the moderate to severe ischemia, 9% of them get excluded once they have a blinded coronary CT and there is left main there. Interestingly, we're finding that even though these patients have moderate to severe ischemia, 17% of them have no obstructive disease. I mean, this is part of a sub-study called the Chow study trying to understand why these patients with core lab determined moderate to severe ischemia continue to have uh, ischemia despite absence of uh, epicardial coronary artery disease. Um, this is kind of the update for the ischemia CKD trial. Again, both the uh, trials are being done in more than 30 countries. We anticipate that for the CKD trial, there will be close to 300 sites. We have randomized 153 patients um, as of last week. Um, and to put this in perspective, the only randomized trials which enrolled patients similar to this was done in the 90s. It was a 26-patient randomized trial, 13 patients in each group, and the trial was actually terminated early uh, within one year because they found a significant benefit of uh, the revascularization strategy. Um, but we have 153 patients. Um, uh, interestingly, the characteristics are the following. So we're seeing that 70% of these patients have diabetes. And because of such high prevalence of diabetes, we are also seeing that many of these patients don't present with classic chest pain. Again, goes back to what we are talking about, atypical nature of presentation of these patients. 40% have no angina. Uh, interestingly, we have a 50-50 split in terms of patients on dialysis and patients not on dialysis. And transplant has been a big issue because there is a strong bias uh, towards invasive strategy for these patients. So for some sites it works, for others it doesn't, but we have a large uh, uh, volume of non-transplant patients. So we strongly encourage sites where they cannot enroll transplant patients to focus on non-transplant patients. But in the trial so far, 28% of uh, patients are actually on a transplant list. So uh, this is uh, uh, critical. So we are seeing this uh, uh, CKD patient conundrum. So when the CKD patient goes to a cardiologist, you know, we kind of throw away our uh, cardiologist hat and focus on the creatinine. So we are very worried about doing anything that can harm the kidneys. And of course, the nephrologists have known that these patients uh, die of cardiovascular uh, conditions. So we are trying to get both cardiologists and nephrologists to uh, 
former team at most of the sites. So we do have nephrologists at uh, every step of the way and also nephrologist uh, PI at uh, every site. So this is the setup at uh, Emory. Uh, the principal investigator is Dr. Kayami. So you, I know that uh, you had some conflicts. You, you couldn't be here today. We have the interventional PI, Dr. Samadhi, and surgical PI, Dr. Halkos, um, the non-invasive PI, Dr. Larakis. We also have nephrology PIs, uh, Dr. Rabhari and Dr. Leah, and study coordinator Nino. I'm not sure if she is here. Um, but what I want to point out is this. So in the main trial, uh, Emory is only a randomized four patients. So it's, uh, it's lagging compared to many of our um, other sites. For CKD, this is more of a recent um, uh, undertaking for Emory. And we, we spoke with the team, got nephrologists involved only a couple of months ago. We yet to see some randomization. But interestingly, if you look at across the street for the Atlanta VA, so this is um, um, Dr. Mavro Maddis is the uh, uh, PI. And there, for the main trial, they've enrolled 110 patients, randomized 62. They're actually among the top five in terms of uh, enrollment globally. Uh, even for ischemia CKD, they've randomized five patients. Again, they're among the top five. I mean, uh, CKD is a small trial. It's very easy to be among the top enrollers. With five patients, they're among the top five uh, globally in terms of uh, enrollment. Um, so to summarize, um, in in, uh, we saw plenty of data to suggest that there is exponential increase in cardiovascular events in patients with CKD uh, who also have stable ischemic heart disease, but their presentation tends to be atypical, and there is plenty of data suggesting that because of the atypical uh, presentation, also because of the fact that people just don't know what to do with these patients, they tend to be under-referred uh, for stress testing and also under-treated. The problem also extends to randomized trials, where the majority of cardiovascular trials have routinely excluded patients with CKD. So many a times when you're treating patients with CKD, we're trying to extrapolate from cohorts uh, without CKD. We, we're not sure if that extrapolation is justifiable. We don't know if something works in non-CKD patients. It will also work in uh, patients with uh, chronic kidney disease. So uh, hopefully this will be the largest uh, treatment strategy and hopefully it'll provide insights into management of uh, stable ischemic heart disease in patients with CKD. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that great talk. It's a very difficult group of patients to work with, obviously. So, so I'll start out with more of a basic question. You know, one of the perplexing things is, so why are these patients different? You know, sort of at the pathobiology level, what's what is the unique, and what are your thoughts about that? I know that's not, there's sort of not a known answer to all of that, but yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I, I think it's a combination of things. First, first of all, they have a lot of risk factors, and we know that with CKD itself, there is a lot of metabolic um, uh, imbalances, and these patients are known to have uh, increased risk of calcification. But the bottom line for all of this is, I think it's a combination of both the comorbidities and the fact that they have CKD and metabolic uh, impairments. There are also a lot of uh, uh, people looking at novel biomarkers, and I think that will be critical to understand why these patients have uh, such a rapid progression of uh, atherosclerosis. I mean, in, in our trial, we also have uh, biorepositories, so we're going to collect biospecimens on uh, hopefully uh, a good group of patients, and we can tease this out further in terms of looking at novel biomarkers. Questions from the group? Sorry, Paul, that was a great uh, talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'll point out one error in your presentation, though. Uh, fr Frank Netter's patient that you got up here uh, <laughs> uh, with a hat and the whole thing. Uh, he, he's, from the, he's from the 50s, maybe 60s. Uh, before we had uh, perfusion imaging or <laughs> echo. Or so... Uh, and he's also clutching his chest, so <laughs> this is a patient without uh, chest pain. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he's uh, uh, a bit of a problem, but he's also a, a question uh, regarding the ischemia trial, which is based on ischemia. And you pointed out that revascularization in chronic kidney disease is not probably uh, helpful, except in situations that are the high... Uh, the, adverse survival things, left main, right. triple vessel, double vessel with LAD. But from the 
ischemia trial, it's not geared to identify that. It's right. A, it's, a, it's identifying ischemia, not not anatomy. Right. Um, so this is, and, and you talk about the, the bias. So the bias, <laughs> I think, at Emory Hospital and so many places, is trying to get people enrolled is that there's still, uh, despite all the imaging modalities, still an interest in the distribution of disease, the anatomy. Uh, as we go forward, I mean, uh, evaluating chronic kidney disease patients, uh, I guess the question is, uh, who do you cast? How do you get them? How do you get them to the point of uh, identifying if they have those high-risk uh, anatomy uh, situations? And uh, how do you, how do you move from? Uh, so so, Mr. Netter's patient. Uh, does that? Uh, how, do, how do you work that guy up? You yeah. said you had a thing. You said, do you cath him? Do you do uh, nukes? Do you do all this stuff? Yeah. Uh, what do you? What do we do today? Yeah. So I think it's very very tricky. I mean, absolutely, especially with CKD patients. Um, uh, you know, the the if you look at the data, um, I mean, I don't know the specifics for Emory, but across the country, it's less than forty percent actually going for stress. I mean, for angiography. <laughs> So in other words, I wouldn't be surprised if many of our CKD patients with left mains are just walking around undetected. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge we're facing because there is some kind of uh, almost like a stigma for these patients. I mean, you know, nobody wants to do anything because we're all worried about their kidneys. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's the first thing we need to overcome. And, uh, you know, uh, our hope is with the trial, we're trying to get both nephrologists and cardiologists to work together and form cardiorenal teams so that, you know, patients can have better care, that is closer care and hopefully some kind of optimal medical therapy. And again, the, even the question of what is optimal medical therapy is not answered for these patients. I mean, it's, it's a very difficult uh, group of patients. Um, in terms of workup, it's, it's a big challenge. I mean, we are hearing from many of the renal transplant centers that they are struggling with this concept. Some of them are doing stress tests, um, and many of them are, uh, and some of them actually have given up on stress tests because of the problems with stress testing in these patients, and have switched to angiography and trying to do cats on all of these patients. So I think a lot of uh, unanswered questions in this field, but I think the critical thing would be to have a cardiorenal alliance, and first of all, I mean, make, you know, more spreading the word that um, understanding the risks of these patients and trying to do something, I think, will be the first step. So, uh, excellent talk and, and just really a really powerful review of the literature. Um, and these are patients we deal with every day. Um, so, I guess uh, a couple of questions. Number one, just to point out that obviously the ischemia trial is uh, based on the premise that, you know, the non invasive imaging is going to risk stratify these patients appropriately. Right. And you pointed out that in the CKD patients, but also in diabetics and other patients with diffuse disease, there are limitations. Um, so I wanted you to expand a little bit on that and kind of talking about what Spencer is, is how do you drive into this discordance between anatomic disease, both in the non-obstructives, as you pointed out, and in the more severe disease, where there may be ischemia anatomy discordance? Um, given that the trial is predominantly based on ischemia detection. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think, you know, since we planned the trial, there is uh, more data uh, suggest, I mean, there is conflicting data. I mean, initially, you know, when we were planning the trial, there was data suggesting ischemia itself is bad. And now we know that from STITCH and other trials that whether the patient had ischemia or no, no ischemia, there was no difference. So even that ischemia hypothesis is being questioned. On the other end of the spectrum, we know from data such as courage uh, and geographic analysis that the extent of CAD was also important. So in other words, we're more and more recognizing that maybe uh, both ischemia and uh, anatomy provide complementary uh, information, and I think both are important. For the main trial, it's slightly easier. In the vast majority of patients, those with GFR greater than 60, all of them have CT. So we'll be able to at least uh, at the end of the trial tease this out to see uh, you know, based on extent of coronary artery disease, does it make a difference in that um, the majority of those uh, group of patients? But again, when uh, points well taken. Hi, thanks for an excellent talk. I have a 
Um, first of all, you showed the slide about the SRD patients if they're revascularized, or patients with CKD, if they're revascularized, they have a higher risk of death than progression to dialysis. And I think the, the same is true even if they don't have any intervention. Yeah, yeah. I.e., if you look at a patient in stage 3 CKD in five years, uh, twice as many will have died right. that end up on dialysis. Yeah, so I think that's what a more support. Yeah. Is do something and not yep. just leave these patients alone. Um, the other questions were related to the issues with the transplant. Um, I wanted you to expound a little bit more about what some of the concerns are. Is it the dialysis patient, uh, patients on the transplant list, or is it the CKD patients that aren't on dialysis? I wanted to understand what some of the concerns with the transplant. Yeah, so... Um I mean, going for the first one, I think your point is absolutely right. I mean, in terms of the competing risk, I mean, these patients are more likely to die than the endpoint that we are worried about. And in fact, like, you know, we sent out a survey to many of our cardiologists saying, oh, what do you think is the number one cause of uh, the most common endpoint in patients with CKD? Is it that they're going to die or is it that they're going to reach dialysis? And many of them think that the patients are going to go, uh, the kidneys are going to fail and they'll reach dialysis, but the data is the opposite. So I think if there is one take home, I think that's a very compelling message to uh, remember that, you know, even though we're focused on kidneys, but their mortality is uh, uh, much higher. So in terms of transplant, what we are seeing uh, both uh, in this country and globally is uh, there is a bias. Uh, everybody wants to cath and revascularize these patients. I mean, regardless of what it is, I mean, whether they are... Um, uh, pre-dialysis or patients on dialysis. So I think it becomes extremely challenging despite lack of good evidence. Um, you know, there is no evidence to support that one strategy is better than the other when you're doing a pre-renal transplant evaluation. And we showed some of the data from other clinical trials and also what the ACCHA says, what we should do for these patients. But there is just a bias. I mean, the transplant surgeons, anesthetists, many of us believe that having a patient who are completely revascularized is better um, and interestingly, you know, we have had discussions with many of the sites because if you have a negative stress test, uh, it's kind of this blissful ignorance. Um, if you don't know the anatomy, the anesthetists are happy, the surgeons are happy to take these patients. But once you define the anatomy or you have a positive stress test, I mean, people are get fixated about CAD. So in other words, we don't know what's the right answer. There is no evidence to support it, but there is a lot of bias. I mean, we are pay facing this bias in this, uh, transplant patients. In the main trial, we're facing it for the majority of patients. Uh, people think that if you have moderate to severe ischemia, everybody should be revascularized. So I think that's one of the challenges in enrolling for the main trial because people think that they know the answer. And just one other quick question about uh, stress testing. What form of stress testing in CKD and dialysis do you think is the best? I mean, yeah. I know there's a lot of controversy about accuracy, but yeah. um, dobutamine stress, nuclear? Yeah, what, what? so that's a great point. Um, if you look at the com uh, composite data from studies, I mean, it indicates that dobutamine stress is slightly more sensitive. I have to be careful at Emory <laughs> uh, to uh, talk about dobutamine stress. But, I mean, the data suggests that. Um, in, in other words, with the nuclear spec, there is concern about multivessel disease and missing uh, stuff, and also because adenosine the it might not increase your coronary flow reserve in patients who have calcified arteries. Uh, it becomes challenging, uh, but again, uh, you know, even though we advocate uh, pharmacological stress tests, I mean, I think that's one of the key things because many of these patients cannot exercise. Pharmacological stress testing with imaging is slightly better. Uh, and, uh, the data supports the vitamin stress echo, but again, it depends on the expertise of the local site. Real quick one, Andy. So the uh, in-stage renal disease patients, the dialysis patients, really seem to be a, a different subgroup of patients. They, they undergo stress tests three times a week with dialysis. Um, the, the, the day where they miss two days and then have the dialysis, is the hardest stress. It's the, it, they uh, tend to die of sudden cardiac death rather than of acute MIs and ending up in our in our unit. So, um, and uh, also we see patients with end stage renal disease who have low ejection fractions that reverse when they get kidney transplantation. So, um, just the point that I think that's a different group of patients, and how we extrapolate some of this data can be difficult. 
Um, the thing that does, has been shown to reduce cardiovascular mortality in dialysis patients is kidney transplantation. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So I think that's an excellent point. And of course, I mean, in the trial, we have flexibility. I mean, you know, we want to do everything uh, to make sure that uh, we, we don't hold back on the kidney transplant. So in other words, if the site says they're extremely biased towards this is what they want, we'll have flexibility around it and we'll permit them to, if they want to do uh, cath and revas closer to the time of transplant, let them go ahead and do it. Because of that notion that if there is one uh, therapy that will save their lives, it's kidney transplant. But in terms of dialysis, pre-dialysis patients, it's interestingly a uh, spectrum. So what we are seeing is there are also patients who get enrolled as pre-dialysis patients. They're not on dialysis. And interestingly, within the first two months, without any other intervention, they progress on to dialysis. So it becomes tricky as to uh, what time point you're looking at because it's more of a continuous spectrum. But the trial, uh, we're going to look for interaction between dialysis versus non-dialysis and see if the effect sizes will be similar. We won't be powered for uh, each of these subgroups, but we, we can look for interaction, and that's one of the pre-specified things that we'll be looking at. I think we'll have to cut it off there. We're out of time, but thanks so much for a really interesting talk. Very important area. Thanks. Thank the preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.